Hello, my name is Brittany Kim and I'm a physical therapist at Reactive Physical Therapy. I'm an orthopedic specialist and one of my subspecialties is helping patients with centralized pain. And today with our Where Do I Start series, I'm going to be talking about cognitive functional therapy. And I think before we get going, we should probably talk about what it is. I'm sure some of you have, are, are very well aware of what it is. You've tried it in the clinic, you've been really successful. Maybe it's also been really challenging at times, and I know I've definitely experienced that myself. Um, and then maybe there's some of you who have never heard of this before, and I'm really excited for you to learn a little bit more because it has been a really helpful treatment tool for me in working with my patients who have centralized pain, but I really feel like it's a valuable intervention that could potentially be used for patients with functional neurological disorders or people with any type of condition where maybe they have some sort of fear avoidance piece with that as well. So let's talk about what cognitive functional therapy is. Cognitive functional therapy was developed by Peter O'Sullivan and his colleagues over the last few decades. And it is kind of what the name implies in that there's a cognitive piece, there's a functional piece, and then you're tying it all together um, as an intervention. And they were studying this intervention primarily with patients with nonspecific low back pain. And a lot of their patient populations tended to be more on the chronic side uh, technically speaking, meaning that their pain was persisting longer than three months of time or normal tissue healing time. And what they found is that it was a very impactful intervention and in a randomized control trial that they did in 2013, they found that it was better to do cognitive functional therapy with this population over doing manual therapy and exercise, which is basically, I would say, more like the standard physical therapy for treating someone with nonspecific low back pain. Those patients had improvements in pain, in function, they had less sick days. It's pretty amazing and I know from my own personal experience I've used this and it has gotten me much further, much faster with a lot of my patients where I feel like it's very appropriate for them. And what's nice about this intervention as well is that it's not like you only do this. Um, a lot of the research that they have done in, in the newest article in 2018 um, in the JOSPT, they laid out a really nice framework and they integrated manual therapy and different things that that person might need. So it's very open-ended, it's comprehensive. Um, I think it's just a really useful tool. And so the with, if you were to kind of break this down a little bit, what you're trying to assess first is the cognitive emotional piece so looking at fear avoidance, looking at how does this affect them emotionally, looking at psychosocial pieces, and then you're looking next into the function part, so the functional tasks that they have to be able to do, looking at it from a mechanical standpoint, a neurophysiological standpoint, trying to break down what's going on motor control wise and how that's impairing the patient's ability to do that task, and then tying those two pieces together, the cognitive piece, the functional piece, and then doing it in a graded exposure manner. And again, I, I know this has been studied in non-specific low back pain, but I just feel like there's so many principles in here that are so applicable to so many of our neurologic patient populations like dystonia, functional movement disorder, 3PD. And I, I think you can really use these tools to start breaking down some of those pieces, especially the psychosocial realm, and start to find a way to help people overcome those things. Um, so I think what I would recommend is, where do you start? I would start with reading those articles, and we're going to have the references in a post in our Instagram. Uh, and I just highly recommend reading those articles. They're very rich in content. They give great patient examples. They make it really clear what it is and how to implement it. And the hard part is really taking that and doing it with a real person in front of you, um, but they make it feel a little bit more doable and simple. And there's just so much good information in there. Um, and I highly recommend just taking that concept and thinking about how you can apply it to different patient populations. And then I do want to share a little bit about some clinical pearls and ways that I've used this and ways to start. And I think one of the best ways to start is um, how Peter Sullivan recommends is really understanding their history and understanding the psychosocial pieces and the functional impairments. And one way that's been helpful for me to do this is using a patient-specific functional scale and one that's been 
altered a little bit. And so I'm going to show you um, the scale. So as you can see here, um, this is a regular patient-specific functional scale, but what's added is an avoidance piece. And this was developed by Janine Holmberg, and we got to see this at CSM in her 3PD talk and is also a part of her review um, that's been recently released for 3PD. And this has just been a great tool to help us understand the activity limitations that people are having and how much they're avoiding it. And this is a great outcome measure that you can use to track progress over time. So um, I'm going to use a, an example of a patient I'm seeing who has Parkinson's and low back pain. And their activity that's painful and difficult to do is bending forward like they're going to pick something up off the ground. And they've rated it, their ability to do that very low, and they're also avoiding it very highly. And the limitation for this is their pain, and it's affecting their ability to do self-care tasks such as dressing. And with this patient and thinking about cognitive functional therapy, the first approach is analyzing not only why they, they are concerned about bending down, do they have, like, why are they avoiding it? Do they have beliefs? Are they worried? Um, just understanding that piece, but then also looking at the movement itself. So bending forward and seeing what the issue is. And in this patient's case, um, when they were bending forward, they were fitting into, he divides it into two different categories where there's kind of this person that's more the over bracer, uh, tightening too much, and then there's the person who doesn't really know where they are in space, the kind of loosey-goosey type of person. And he was definitely more in that realm of guarding too much, over bracing, um, just high protective responses when he was bending forward. So I decided to take him through a movement experiment. Um, I, there's a lot of different ways you can go. You can start with some deep breathing, nervous system calming type stuff um, with the task that they're having difficulty with, but I felt like it might be a little challenging for him to integrate that. And so I, want, I, I, I decided that it would be best to just go down this movement experiment part. So what I did is I had him go into double knee to chest and supine, and I asked, how is this? What do you think? And he said, oh, I love this stretch. It feels so good on my back. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. And then we moved on into the next one. So I took him into child's pose. Um, and again, he said, oh, I love the stretch. It makes my back feel really good. I took a picture of him in child's pose and I showed him and I said, I want you to look at what your back is doing. And I, I showed him how this position where he's kind of flexed, he has a lot of lumbar flexion, is very similar to when he's bending down to pick something up off the ground. And he was a little confused by that and he asked, well, why does it feel good in this position, but why does it hurt me so much to bend down? And then we talked about, this opened a really nice door to open, to talk about um, the nervous system, what happens when the nervous system changes, how he's probably been conditioned over time to believe and be concerned about bending forward and that it's been reinforced by negative experiences in the past and that we need to train his nervous system to stop being so protective and to help him be able to bend forward without pain. And so just out of curiosity, I asked him, well, after we've kind of done this and we've talked about this, I'd love for you to bend forward and tell me what you think. And he didn't have any pain. And normally his pain is very terrible and excruciating with bending forward and he had more range of motion. And I was pretty blown away by that and so was he. And I mean, sometimes this stuff can be magical like that. It's just the nervous system can, can change like this. And so that impact can be that powerful. And for him, this was much more beneficial than doing the stretching program that we had tried and getting his back to be more mobile, actually addressing the beliefs and the nervous system changes was more impactful for him than these other types of interventions. So I hope this video was helpful. I hope you go down this road of exploring this a little bit more and um, I hope that you make a big impact on your patients. Thank you for watching.